morning. Uh, welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center for tonight's program. Uh, and Frank, Pro Professor Frank Wu's case is good morning. Uh, Frank is uh, speaking, uh, will be joining us from California. And we have Professor Davis White joining us from uh, Canada. And then of course, today's uh, moderator, uh, Ing Chen will be joining us here in Hong Kong. And it, it's, uh, I'm really delighted that Asia Society um, Hong Kong uh, can bring you this program uh, entitled Rule of the Road, China's Talent Program and U.S. Research Discrimination. And from two distinguished professors, uh, both good friends of Asia Society Hong Kong, and we're really delighted tonight that we can um, be host to this program. And I know we will have uh, viewers from all over um, joining us. And I want to remind um, the audience that they can submit their questions uh, directly on Zoom for members only, and then YouTube, Facebook, or Slido. The code for Slido is 49776. Uh, and please, uh, as we uh, uh, progress with the presentations, uh, please submit your question. And I know Ying will um, be able to um, uh, come to that when the uh, uh, Q&A session starts. So uh, these two, uh, all three of the, our distinguished uh, speaker tonight needs really no introduction. So a quick uh, word, uh, Professor uh, Davis Weig is Professor Emeritus of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and, uh, and has a longtime resident of Hong Kong. And we also are joined by Professor Frank Wu, uh, president of Queens College, um, City University of New York. And Frank is uh, just assumed his post as the new president of Queens College. Congratulations, Frank. And also, uh, I know Frank from our past uh, affiliation in Committee 100, uh, where uh, Frank had a leadership role for many years. So uh, welcome back to Hong Kong via, uh, via online. And of course, tonight's uh, moderator, uh, uh, Professor Ying Chen, Master of Sun Hing College at Hong Kong University, and who has uh, also a, 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 a you know, very former journalist and very, um, uh, aware and very much uh, uh, on top of this subject that we're talking tonight. So we're really delighted that Ying is going to be moderating. So I'm going to hand it over now uh, to Professor Ying Chen to get the program started. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to moderate this very important discussion with two distinguished scholars and expert observers of US-China relations. I'll first invite both professors to give a brief presentation. I'll follow up with my questions. I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions and then I'll take questions from our audience out there. Um, now off to the prof Professor Sway. Well, I'm trying to cut, am I on? I'm trying to set this up my, for some reason my, uh, uh, I have not, I just see myself but I can't see how to, let's see, your screen the sharing. On. The, the, the screen share is on. We, we're, we're, we're looking at your screen. You are, look, and you can see my slides? Yes, I'm looking at thousand grains of sand hypothesis. Okay, so I got to move to this point. Okay, yeah. get me out of the way. Okay, well, that's fine. So let's get that out of the way. Uh, where is that? There we go. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and thank you to Asia Society for organizing what I think is a really big topic uh, and a really important topic, uh, particularly given the, the current administration uh, in the, the United States and the difficulties that the two sides, the United States and China, are confronting. So this is uh, the front page. If I can make four main points from the beginning. I think the first is that China has experienced a terrible brain drain and that 80 to 90 percent of its very best talent have refused to return to China full time. And one of the things for, for me is I'm a Canadian, so I understand brain drain. Uh, but I think that America has only benefited from the brain drain. America has uh, its science and technology has improved largely because of other countries drain. Uh, so Americans have very little understanding of what it means for a country to really want to try and get people, their people back and particularly the case of China. Now, back in 2008, Leon Chao, who was working 
um, who was a leader in the Chinese Communist Party, set up a program to bring back the very best talent to create an innovative society through reverse migration. And uh, his goal was to bring back cutting edge technology from the West, no doubt about it. It's been very upfront. It's been very clear that that was their goal. But the goal was not to steal US technology. Third point I would make is, and I think it's really important uh, for people who, who see this only as uh, a racialism against Chinese, is that there really have been too many mainland born Chinese who are working in the United States who've really been cheating. Uh, I'll talk about the cheating. Uh, uh, they are largely part-time participants in the Thousand Talents Plan, and they have been. Uh, I think the data are pretty clear that they have been abusing the access that they have had to research jobs, funding, and grants. But given the context of the United States and China's uh, uh, sort of uh, increasing hostility uh, and the, the Trump administration uh, belief that uh, uh, national economic security is closely related to um, uh, national security, that the United States has exaggerated the problem and has securitized the problem, uh, and that that really threatens uh, U.S. China. Uh, that really threatens U.S. China uh, uh, collaboration, and that collaboration is very important for the whole world. So. Uh, why the problem? So first of all, I think one of the problems is that China has a strategy often to, to mobilize. So when Li and Chao decides that he wants to put together this program and bring people back, he, as we say in Chinese, he dongyuan, he mobilizes uh, cities, mayors, universities, uh, using propaganda, using a lot of money to try and get cities and universities to bring people back. Um, second problem is, and I look at the individual level, is I think a lot of individuals see opportunities to make a lot of money. For me, this is more a question of financial reward than what, for, by Chinese side, uh, than national security, that it's not a conspiracy. Um, back in 2005, I've done field research where it was pretty clear that if you were a Chinese in the United States and you wanted to do well, coming back to China, you had to get your hands on second tier technology. Pretty good technology, but it wasn't world-class technology. It just was something that wasn't there in China. And if you could bring back that technology, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, universities, they would reward you with a nice post. Now we're 15 years later, and that medium stage technology, second tier technology is just not good enough. And so anybody who wants to return to China and wants to get a post, they have to bring cutting edge technology. And so that creates that upgrades, uh, that technology then is technology that the Americans can look at and say, God, this is our national production. This is our really cutting edge stuff. If that stuff goes to China, we're in trouble. Um, now, the other thing that, the Ameri that China has actually proven, and it's also an individual level, is there are a fair amount of Americans who are willing to take Chinese money and uh, uh, sell their technology in essence. So we've seen the Lieber case uh, at Harvard, we've seen the Moffitt case uh, down in, Calif in, in uh, Florida, where Americans, and these could be non-ethnic Chinese Americans, are very willing to transfer technologies that they've been working on with U.S. money, U.S. grant money to China in return for a lot of money, and they've hidden that money. So that's why the problem, two points. Third is, as I said, there's a lot of mistrust going on between the United States and China. China's too opaque uh, on these programs. If you really go in and look at it, it's amazing to a certain extent how secretive the Chinese have tried to be on this, uh, and, and so that really creates a problem. Um, and as I said, the, the Trump administration securitizes uh, this issue. So what I did with my research team is we put together, we have 1,400 CVs of participants uh, who have worked in this program. And we, in, in Thousand Talents, but in actually three programs, Thousand Talents and two others uh, less famous, and we've done statistical analysis of their uh, uh, their quality, the quality of the work that they've been doing. And I would show you uh, two, two out outcomes. One is that Li Chao wanted people to come back full time. His goal was to get all these people to come back. The problem is that only about 25% of them have returned full time. 
So 75%, right? 75% of the people who join these programs are still sitting in chair in very good positions in the United States with lots of access to data, lots of your running research labs. Um, and they are, and that's what this slide is supposed to show you, is they are the best talent uh, uh, in terms of the publications. Uh, H-Index says, how widely are you cited? The impact of the journals in which they publish uh, is uh, very significant. And the number of papers of, that they publish relative to other people in other programs, but relative to full-time participants. So if we differentiate who joins part-time, meaning you're still staying in the United States, or full-time, meaning that you've gone back to China, the gap is great. Those who have gone back to China are just not of the same quality of the people who have stayed in the United States. Now, what that means is that in many ways, the United States has benefited. So when we did a different statistical analysis, we found out that the people whose papers were most cited were main, mainland Chinese, mainland born Chinese, uh, re living in the UK, the US and Canada. People publishing the best journals were those living in Canada and the US. Uh, I, I make a caveat that the findings affected partly because top journals are in English, um, but it really shows that the US has benefited remarkably. And I think that's a very important point to make that this, these people, these people are joining the top talent. These are the best of the best Chinese. Now, uh, beginning around 2018, April, uh, the United States started to get very worried about this. And the FBI started to mobilize universities, Congress, uh, National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation to investigate. And as I said, they clearly found some problems. I'll go into it a little bit later. Shadow laboratories where, you know, take Lieber, for example, the guy at Harvard ran a big laboratory in at Harvard, but then he sets up a laboratory that does the same kind of research uh, in Wuhan. But most of this is really what I call double dipping, where you have a job in the U.S. and you have a job in, in, in China, or you get a grant from the NIH and you get a grant from the Chinese side, and they may be similar, they may be related. But what you're doing is, you know, I mean, it's not ethical. Uh, there's no doubt it's not ethical to take two full-time jobs, but whatever the US, the FBI has said, it, there's not a, a lot of illegal theft or transfer of technology. And that's a real problem for the US and the FBI because uh, they, they really wanna find people guilty of crimes and they can't do it. Um, so just to give you a quick, you can read down this. This is just a list, recent findings by the NIH, but you can see that of 256 scientists, they found 63 people they found guilty of some kind of misbehavior. 19% were negative and 18 pending. So I always say what happens to those 19%. But a lot of the problems were people failed to give foreign, announced foreign grants, they didn't disclose their participation in a foreign talent program. Another big thing uh, is that people have been offered or invited, uh, these are very good uh, researchers, are invited to do peer review of other people uh, who are applying for NIH or NSF grants. And in five cases that they, of, of all the cases they investigated, 5% of those people took the information in that peer review in the paper that they were evaluating and sent the information back to China um, uh, before any work, further work has been done. But you can see these are very senior people if you look at the age uh, of the people. Now, uh, now let's get into a little bit of racial profiling and a little bit of a problem because the FBI actually believes in what it calls the thousand grains of sand, uh, which basically means that uh, Chinese security agencies mobilize and pressure uh, Chinese, ethnic Chinese, to spy for them. And so you can see FBI Director Ray says China has pioneered a societal approach to stealing innovation, and everybody's in on it, right? And 130,000 Chinese graduate students, basically, he's saying, could be uh, potentially spies. And the president is actually, President of the United States actually said that all Chinese students are spies. Um, but, but this concept of the thousand grains of sand, which motivates the FBI to investigate largely Chinese and assumes from the beginning that they are vulnerable to Chinese intelligence, the guy who invented that idea, 
a former FBI agent. He now says it's not true. So that's very useful. Uh, going in the right direction, go, go, go in the right direction. Uh, okay, so um, you can look at this article by Kim, but, but clearly there has been racial profiling. So between 1997 and 2009, 70% of the defendants under the Economic Espionage Act had Chinese names. Uh, in the five years that followed, that was up to 52% of the defendants had Chinese names. Why there would be only Chinese stealing or doing this kind of stuff, uh, this suggests that uh, there's an overemphasis on searching for Chinese, partly because of the thousand grains of, of sand strategy. 21% uh, of Chinese were charged and then let go, exonerated of their various crimes. But among non-Chinese, the rate was only 11% uh, of people uh, who were charged and then exonerated. Um, another th problem is what's called pretextual prosecutions, where you, you, the FBI goes and they, they accuse somebody of something, uh, of, of stealing some technology. They negotiate back and forth, and the guy cuts a deal because what he did was he may have lied to the FBI in the interview, but he didn't really do anything illegal, but the FBI will charge him with lying to an FBI agent, which is a federal crime, and so he, can get in, he or she can get into trouble when, in fact, they really... Uh, I didn't commit a crime. Um, okay, so a little bit of trouble, sorry. Move to this one. Um, now, one of the big problems is this whole question of co-publication and, 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 and doing collaborative research. And the, the NIH says that excessive, quote, excessive co-authorship with scholars in China is a sign of potential technological theft. So Chinese in the United States, actually, or people in the United States working with China, if they do a lot of publishing together, then it's possible that they're, that they're involved in some kind of theft. The truth is they probably share collaborative research. They may have a joint project. And, and community, the scientific community, loves co-publication, right? It sees people from different countries, different perspectives, different access to research, different access to money, uh, and that, that, in fact, since 2010, percent of U.S. publications uh, from collaboration has increased uh, by 50 percent, uh, and that the U.S. in fact suffer, would suffer if there was less um, uh, co-publication because it's helped the U.S. Uh, publish more articles. Uh, okay, my machine is not moving there. Go this way. So, um, right, so I've done that one. Sorry for this. Let me move this. There we go. Um, okay, so there's the co-publication. Now, uh, so now we're really, that, that's sort of the meat of it. Ying Chan, you want me to, do I have time? Have I used up my time? And we can talk later about what I think the Chinese need to do, what the Americans right here, what the Americans can do uh, on this problem. You want me to keep going? Uh, those are exactly my questions, and I think some of the questions coming in. You've identified the question issues so well, so maybe we'll go to the Frank. what to do later, and That's let's fine. hear from uh, Frank first, and then we'll come back to you. That's okay. great. Cool. Oh, Thank okay. you very much. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll have to Frank? turn off screen sharing in order for me to show my screen. No, I want to use my slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Trying so my best to turn it off. While, while, while you're Stop turning it off, yeah. it. Okay. I always start these talks by saying, I'm an American. I was born in America. I grew up in America. So I think that's important to establish uh, given uh, the subject we're talking about. I've entitled this, Are All Chinese Students and Chinese Americans Spies and Foreign Agents? So I'll go through the slides quickly. Uh, and what I would like to do is provide the context and the history. So this doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's been much talk about clash of civilizations, a thesis uh, promoted by Samuel Huntington, a late Harvard professor, actually embraced uh, by the uh, Trump administration the State Department's policy person, the head policy person uh, she sent left, uh, wrote a memo explaining that China is different because it's the first superpower to uh, threaten the United States that is not Caucasian. 
So there's a real sense uh, that this is a contest. Huntington's book, written before 9-11, was much praised after 9-11. He said that within our lifetimes, we would see a cataclysmic struggle between the West, led by the United States, Islam, and China. Uh, he actually saw it as a three-way battle, uh, but it was the fight against Islam that really attracted uh, readers after 9-11. So serious thinkers have talked about military war, not just trade war, not just cultural war. So on the right, you see a RAND study, War with China, thinking that through that through that RAND does. does. Uh, these, by the way, th these are not racists. These are smart people. Graham Allison's book was a bestseller, Destiny for War. He called it the Thucydides trap. That was the Greek poet and general uh, who said when you have uh, uh, Allison uh, explained that Thucydides uh, had pointed out when you have a uh, rising power and established power, in most, not all, many people have overstated Allison's uh, thesis. He did not say it's inevitable that you have war. He just said throughout human history, that's the more common outcome. So people are actually talking about this. Uh, they're, they're thinking it through. Uh, this is not just academic. Uh, people are really uh, considering, uh, what if the United States and China go to war? All right, so a quick recap, only Nixon could go to China. 1972, uh, ping-pong diplomacy. Uh, Nixon uh, establishes uh, the initial contact through Henry Kissinger. And then you have normalization in 1979. And we have ongoing interaction until just a few years ago. That's based on a, a concept of engagement, constructive engagement. The idea was if the United States interacts with China, whether it's through culture or the economy, uh, et cetera, uh, that China will eventually uh, open up, it will liberalize, it will become more Western, it will have rule of law, et cetera. Uh, that hasn't happened. And so there's been a rethinking. Uh, in the middle here is the Hoover Institution report uh, entitled Constructive Vigilance. This report, which came out two years ago, is, is a turning point. Why? Because it was written by more than three dozen China hands, virtually all of whom previously promoted engagement. Okay, so this is what's important. So it's, it's people, liberal and conservative, okay, who said, let's engage with China. Let's have the United States engage with China. And then they've decided that doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work because China is not changing. China is rising as a power with its own model. Uh, and there are many studies now of, uh, for example, uh, Chinese uh, uh, activities on U.S. college campuses, uh, are they interfering with American higher education? Are they setting up uh, Communist Party cells? And it appears that they are. So there's a concern about united front influence. Uh, the uh, brutalist building there, that's the main library of University of California, San Diego. A few years ago, UCSD invited the Dalai Lama to speak. Uh, the Chinese government apparently organized uh, Chinese students. I don't mean Chinese Americans, I mean Chinese students uh, to say that inviting the Dalai Lama uh, was offensive to them and then, uh, according to widely published reports, uh, punished University of California, San Diego for having invited the Dalai Lama uh, by saying that Chinese uh, professors and scholars and students couldn't go to UCSD and so on and so forth. So uh, there is an effort uh, to ensure that American institutions higher education uh, conform uh, to Chinese standards, not American standards of academic freedom. Okay, that's all the context. Let's talk now about cases. Let's begin with a little history. So the inventor of the Chinese uh, missile program, the father of Chinese rocketry was an American. He was born in mainland China, came to the United States, worked on the Manhattan Project. That's the effort to develop uh, the A-bomb uh, and H-bomb that were used in World War II. He was a United States military officer. He founded Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Okay, so he was an immigrant. He attended one meeting in Pasadena of uh, a communist uh, party group, and uh, the United States decided he was a spy. He was driven out of the United States, went to China, where he did not want to go. But once he was driven out, he never came back. Uh, when he died in his 90s, his former US military official said he was no more communist than we are. This is a terrible mistake. So the former Undersecretary of the Navy 
called his deportation the stupidest thing this country ever did. Why? Because this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The fear about this guy was that he would help China. That wouldn't have been true but for the United States actions. What I mean is, had he been left alone, he would have continued to prosper. His career would have gone forward. He would have contributed as a Chinese American. But instead, driven out, he went to China. And what the United States feared became true because of the government's actions. Another early case, uh, Wen Ho Li, uh, thought to be a spy, having uh, given nuclear weapons secrets. This is 20 years ago to China. Uh, the U.S. District Judge uh, presiding over the case, you can read his statement here, apologized to Dr. Lee. That hardly ever happened. happened. Judges don't usually apologize to criminal defendants. Ultimately, take a plea deal, uh, which does involve uh, his admitting that he had improperly handled classified information. But there is no evidence, and all the charges were dropped, that he was a spy. He wasn't a spy innocent until proven guilty. And the judge said that uh, the court had been misled by the prosecutors and scolded them. Okay, now let's turn to today. I always, right up front, talk about real cases. There are three categories of cases I'm going to talk about. One, real cases, two, false positives, and three, changing standards or double standards. I, I want to say as clearly as possible, China is engaged in espionage. I have no doubt about that. Uh, there are people of Chinese descent doing bad things to the United States and in the United States, some of it at the direction of the Chinese government. So here's an example. Uh, this is an individual uh, based in Canada who hacked into American uh, databases uh, to steal fighter plane secrets praised uh, by uh, Chinese press for having done so. Uh, that this person is a spy, all right? And I think it's important right up front to acknowledge that. And as an American, I want us to do something about this. We should investigate, we should prosecute, we should punish um, this individual uh, pled guilty, okay? So there are real cases, that's the first category. Second, there are false positives. This is Sherry Chen and Dr. Xiaoxin Xi, both naturalized citizens. They are immigrants, 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 not Chinese. They're ethnic Chinese, but they're United States citizens, both accused of espionage, all charges brought. Let me be absolutely clear about this. They did not plead out. They were not convicted of lesser charges. The charges were voluntarily dropped, dropped in the United States. Statement. These individuals, 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 their careers are wrecked. Their names are dragged through mud. They'll never be able to put the pieces back together again, even though they're just ordinary folks. Sherry Chen was an award-winning flood forecaster. She works for the National Weather Service. What did she do wrong? She visited her elderly, sick mother in China. That's actually, that's commendable behavior, right? In a 130-page opinion, an administrative law judge reviewing the termination of her employment said she'd been the victim of a gross miscarriage of justice. Now, that judge didn't find racial profiling, but said that uh, Ms. Chen should be restored to her job. That hasn't been done. Dr. Shi, former chair of the physics department at Temple University, uh, it turns out he was not talking about secrets. He wasn't doing anything illicit. He was talking uh, with others about his own research in an entirely permissible manner, yet accused of being a spy. Uh, all charges dropped. These two cases led to uh, Obama-era reforms in how other cases would be brought, but they're not the only two. There are numerous false positives, people who are being accused, even though they're just U.S. citizens, sometimes green card holders, who are just going about their lives. That's the second category of case. Then they're changing standards. Okay, This is the last category of case. All right, so uh, when I say this is all new, so I get called by journalists and explain, this is, this is a new effort. They ask me, well, why do you say that? Is that your interpretation? I always try to show the evidence. Here is the official press release from the Justice Department. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announces new initiative. All right, so this is November 1st, 2018. The laws were on the books. They just weren't enforced. They weren't an enforcement priority. They weren't regarded as high level criminal behavior. And this was such a new initiative. There was a big press conference to tell people we're going to undertake a new initiative. So when I say it's new, those aren't my words. Those are the prosecutor's words. This is now 
What was it like 11 years ago? Here's what the NIH was doing, touting 30 years of collaboration. So I just poked around on the NIH website and I found this. Uh, 10 years prior to the announcement that this would be criminal behavior, it was being encouraged. So conduct went from being encouraged to being okay, to being frowned upon, being prohibited, to being criminal, right? If, if you just go back to that time period, every American university wanted a partnership in China. And who did they tap to do that? They tapped their Chinese immigrant faculty and staff, help us generate a collaborative program. Let's go get grants together. Let's do all this together. And the NIH is promoting this. If people were in a thousand talents program back then, you'd put out a press release and say, our faculty are so good. They've been bestowed this honor, right? So these are changing standards. They're also double standards. Here's another case. All right. Was this person guilty? Yeah, he was guilty of double dipping. One of the leading climate change naturalized U.S. citizen worked for the U.S. government. Three different summers went to China and worked at Ocean University for the grand total of $2,100. That's $700 per year during his summer vacations. Okay. Is this a felony? Well, the United States government thinks so. The judge presiding over this case, like uh, the judge presiding over the Wen Ho Lee case, when she took the plea deal, she said it was regrettable that she had to sentence him. She sentenced him to one night in prison, which he had already served awaiting trial. Why? Well, because the point was, did he do something wrong? Yes. But did it merit his being driven from the nation? She then said, you know, um, your family is still here. You're a U.S. citizen. You can come back. I want you to know you're welcome. Federal judges don't typically do that uh, in espionage cases. All right. So uh, did he do something wrong? Yes. Is it espionage or is it the sort of thing that if he were Caucasian, someone would have said, hey, you know, um, you need to redo these forms. It would have been considered likely uh, a few years ago or with a different identity a more minor employment type of issue, not something suited for federal government felony prosecution. Okay, so uh, I agree with Dr. Zweig. There's a, a national interest at stake here, American national interest. If you don't care about the civil rights of Chinese Americans, fine. This doesn't help the United States because what is happening is there's a chilling effect. Even those who are perfectly innocent fear and they either aren't going to come or they're going to leave because they're worried they're facing a glass ceiling. So uh, here you see some of the press reports. One of the inventors of an early coronavirus test was a Chinese immigrant who had come here, who was driven out, who went back to China. So who benefited from that? Not the United States. China benefited from that. This is backwards. It's the exact opposite of what we think it is. This is harming the American national interest even if there isn't an intent. But by the way, I don't think FBI agents are bigots. Uh, I want to be clear about that. Uh, it's the effect here, the consequences. So if you're a talented person and you're sitting in Shenzhen, you might decide, I'm staying in Shenzhen. Or you might decide, I'm going to Canada or the UK, not the United States, to pursue your career. There's also a problem of scale. Right? You read about there's 50 cases. Oh, that's terrible. There are 350,000 students coming from China, approximately, between 350,000 and 400,000 per year pre-pandemic. Let's say there are 4,000 spies, All right? Let me be clear, that's a problem. That's a huge problem, 4,000, right? I mean, on every American college campus of any note, there, there's a spy running around, all right? We need to address that. By the way, no one even thinks it's that many cases, but let, let's just pretend it's 4,000. That's 1% of the number of students coming. So we have a problem with China. And unless you know China, you don't understand this, right? Everything scales up. When the COVID-19 came out, most Americans never heard of Wuhan. Wuhan is a city bigger than almost all American cities. Yet in Chinese terms, it's second tier. Why, why do I mention that? Because you have to adjust for scale. 50 cases is less than 1% of 1% of the number of Chinese foreign students coming. And there are 10X as many Chinese Americans. So you're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny number of, uh, let's put it bluntly, wrongdoers. There are people who have done wrong, but 
99% of people of ethnic Chinese uh, background in the United States are just like their neighbors and co-workers. But the way that this has exploded, it cast doubt on the loyalty of everyone else. Okay, there's a historical precedent, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese American internment. Chinese Exclusion Act was racial on its face. It was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was meant to keep out Chinese. The Japanese American internment, likewise, 120,000 individuals, two thirds of them, two thirds of the native born US citizens, not accused, much less convicted of any wrongdoing, locked up because of the fear out of ethnic affinity, they would be loyal to another nation. So there are uh, difficult dilemmas and balances. So people may know Chinese did come in as paper sons. The original illegal immigrants were Chinese. During the exclusion era, they lied. Uh, they bought papers and came to the United States. So racial profiling, uh, Professor Zweig already mentioned this. President Trump said almost every student from China is a spy, right? These are not my words. I don't believe it. But I would ask you, how many people believe that all or almost all students coming from China are spies? Christopher Ray, director of the FBI, says it's a whole of Chinese society threat. It, every single part of China and talks about unconventional collectors of intelligence, such as students, scholars. All right, here's another headline. It's interesting, this story just went away, um, even though it was well attested to that uh, President Trump used a dinner with CEOs to claim that Chinese students are all spies. In addition, Americans of every background who have contact with China are now being surveilled. Why? Because the idea is China is an enemy. Okay, so here's the dilemma. Uh, there are some Chinese who embrace a diaspora identity and ethnic nationalism. That is, they view themselves as overseas Chinese, not as Chinese immigrants, not as Chinese Americans. That's beyond the scope of this talk. It's not for me to comment on people's choices, whether to assimilate or not assimilate, how transnational would be. But there's a real fear of the decline of white Christian America and an invasion. And historically, Yellow Peril was about the immigrants being the vanguard of a force that's coming in. Lastly, uh, this uh, it has reached such levels that even Gary Locke, third generation American of Chinese descent, governor of the state of Washington, United States ambassador to China, is being portrayed as a Chinese official in political attack ads. Uh, so this made headlines at the New York Times. I'll close here, 1869, Manifest Destiny is realized when the Transcontinental Railroad is completed at Promontory Point, Utah, and a golden spike is driven in in a grand ceremony. The western half of that massive infrastructure project, the largest uh, ever at that time, was built by 10 to 15,000 Chinese laborers. People of Chinese descent have been part of American history for generations. Yet now, as before, we're being looked at as perpetual foreigners. I would submit to you it's possible and necessary to enforce American laws without engaging in these types of tactics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the very uh, perceptive, uh, insightful presentation. Uh, both of you, are, they are sobering, scary, and worrisome. Now, the follow-up question is clearly, is it gonna get worse? Given the current political climate, the campaign, and the uh, immigrant bashing, Asian bashing, Chinese bashing from the highest office of the land. So is it gonna get worse? And my sec then my second question is that, what can be done about it? It's a very complicated situation. So, gentlemen. Uh, you want me to go first? Get before? Sure. So let me, um, uh, the first question was, will it get worse? Well, the problem is that um, uh, Joe Biden hasn't proven to be, and the Democrats have not proven to be exempt from uh, the hostility scene and the idea of sort of China as the enemy. Um, they may be less... Uh, susceptible to the natural 
uh, racial profiling or the natural race, racialist perspective because they have more active people in Congress who are Asian Americans, uh, who may be able to speak out, who have spoken out before. Uh, they may be, and you know, this is a, um, I think the Democrats will be much more sensitive to questions of race and minority rights and things like that. So, so that at, at the sort of the racial level, it may be better. But in terms of the hostility to China, I don't think it's going to get any better. Now, if I can share my screen again, right? So here we go. Good. Um, so I've, I've been in touch with, um, is this okay? Can you see it, Ying? Oh, yes. Okay. So I've been in touch with uh, people on both sides. Um, and here's some of the things I, I outlined. I think the Chinese have a responsibility for this, and they need to recognize that part of the problem has been, uh, and, and, you know, Frank said, I mean, part of the problem is the Chinese have, have not done such a very good job, particularly in the question of transparency, right? We've seen, you can go online, the president, the White House has just come out with this new document, um, uh, which has copies of secret contracts, even in Chinese, that say that the researchers under the Thousand Talents program have to lie to NIH or to their units back in China if they want this. So that's really a problem. And, and so China needs to uh, uh, reform all that. Uh, even if you look at the new program, which re replaces the TTP, it's just not transparent enough. And that's a problem. So we really need the problem of transparency on the Chinese side. Um, uh, I would say joint labs, things like that. If you have a joint lab, it should be public. You know, Liebers should have been able to announce that he was setting up a lab in Wuhan, uh, was going to be working there three months a year, and and that would have been fine. And then people might have said, "Well, you want to be careful what you're doing." This is Lieber from Harvard, but but it was all done secretly, uh, and that's a real problem. And the bottom point is that ethnic Chinese researchers uh, in the U.S. who get China grants and NSF grants, they have to tell the American side that they've applied or have gotten a Chinese grant. So that the Chinese, so that the Americans can say, look, is this person overcommitted to their Chinese uh, work? We, we can't give them an NSF grant because they won't have the time to do it. This needs to be much, much, much more open. On the American side, um, I agree with a lot of things that Frank said, uh, you know, investigate, but surgical strikes only. You know, don't make this an all of China that all Chinese are suspicious. You got a person who you think is is gone and done something bad, go get him. No doubt. You know, I think Frank and I share that. But don't make it as, you know, this sort of uh, nationwide, culture-wide. Um, the FBI should uh, be more transparent. I mean, Frank was talking about what percentage of people uh, actually are engaged in this, right? They won't give us the numbers. I have been pushing NIH and NSF to say, okay, how many applicants do you have who you can tell are ethnic Chinese and they could do it or, or mainland born Chinese, right? You can do it through Indian names and you could say, all right, we know that 7% or, you know, 5% uh, are engaged in this kind of activity. We, we, we just get the numbers. So it's like 399 cases investigated, uh, maybe 180 people are, are found to be, at this point, 180 people have been found by NIH to be guilty. So they're just not being transparent themselves um, on that. But I think, and this is uh, some, some, this would not make me so popular uh, among uh, uh, Chinese side is, I think NSF and NIH really need to call China to the carpet and threaten that any, anybody who's American uh, who, who, who's applying for or gets an NSFC, a China grant, um, uh, they, they have to be, you know, they have to be carefully monitored, be, especially if they're not sharing information, or maybe just not even if you're, you know, not even get a chance to get an NSF uh, grant. The last point I would make is I'm a big fan of dialogue, right? My whole life since I was Right to to go to Frank's, uh, you know, I'm a Canadian. I lived in China from '74 to '76. I've been doing this for 50 years, um, and it's always been a question for me of dialogue, interaction. There are Chinese you can work with, Chinese you can't. Um, but I think that we really need to start a kind of dialogue um, between the U.S. and China on these 
uh, whether it's Asia Society, whether it's Committee of 100, whether it's you know whoever on the on the Western side and on the Chinese side, we really need to get be pushing uh, to sit down and talk about this because if not, it's just going to get worse. Uh, if Trump wins, we're in huge trouble. Um, but even with the even with the Democrats, I think it's in trouble. Well, obviously, you've given a lot of thought to these, and you have all these ideas. They are rational and reasonable. Now, Thank but you. the issue is we live in the context of cultural conflicts, uh, uh, polarization, and weaponization of r- relationships. Of um, and, and you mentioned uh, Biden. Um, you have both parties who have a consensus on we have we living in a toxic political climate in the U.S. Do you see any room for a kind of rational resolution or mitigation of these issues that both of you have talked about? Frank. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, China is an easy target. It has always been. And I work very hard to not be partisan. So uh, let me talk for a moment about the Chinese Exclusion Act, because uh, history repeats itself again and again. When that was a proposal in the 1870s, politicians fell over themselves to be more anti-China than their rival didn't matter what party you were in, it didn't matter what part of the United States you were in, there were very, very few defenders of people of Chinese background, including, what's interesting is, many of their attackers also were immigrants, European immigrants, who saw the Chinese as racial rivals. So uh, this is actually not a partisan issue. Um, It's really easy to terrible policies about face masks. No, it's China. Blame China is a recurring theme. There are better ways to do this, right? At every tit for tat, uh, you know, you do this, we're going to do that. You ban someone, we'll ban someone. And it's just escalating because we explicitly now have a policy of disengagement of the great unraveling, the great uncoupling. You know, it's been given many different names. But the idea is these two nations, the biggest economies in the world, now are going to go their own ways. There's going to be one internet for Americans, one internet for the Chinese, one cell phone standard. And, you know, in Europe, Africa, Latin America, they're being forced to pick in Canada, right? P- people are being forced, entire industries have to pick. You set up your supply chain this way or that way, it cannot come into contact with Chinese talent that is still coming to the United States and can contribute by explaining the rules of the road. You know, if if Professor Zweig's work, other people's work were presented in a culturally sensitive way, that would alleviate much of the that was announced when, you know, these were accounting problems. That's not to deny the bad acts, but size this. That's why in 2018, they had to have a press conference and say, we have a new initiative. So, um, do you... no, yeah, I would. This is a this is a serious issue about the people uh, about training. So I can say, uh, Frank, that I've, I've I've interviewed the head of NSF, the China group, and one of their set. Okay. Do you see more rationality? Uh, prevail and people need data from China. We need actually we need international 